have a hard time. I like Chris Paul, like, as a person and as a player. But that stuff is, like, we talk about, is there any other greatest of all time? Like, we talk about him in that conversation of greatest of all time is yes. position. Is there any other greatest of all time in anything that we, like, hey, he was great, but he sure did do a lot of nut punching. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the right time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. It is Foxworth Friday. Dominique Foxworth, what's going on? Man, I had a great time on that uh, that Don't Block Me Bo YouTube exclusive. My man was displaying a shopping bag like it was art <laughs> yes check this out we do an unblock me bow but now we're doing it as a youtube exclusive check it out uh just google unblock me bow on i say google it on the youtubes youtube unblock me bow look it up you'll be able to see it uh we had allowed three people to try to get themselves unblocked if you are a person who would like to be unblocked i've come to find out there's still some of you out there hit us up you can give you an opportunity to get back on the twitter feed that i don't even use that much anymore but this was a very interesting one. It caused me to do some level of introspection about the way that I had been getting down in the past. And so, like, I appreciate y'all helping make me better people and the opportunities that I have to help make some of you better. You know? I stopped myself because I almost said to help some of you because be better because we had one <laughs> mother who definitely needed to be better. Um, but we're going to talk some NBA playoffs a little bit while we're here. We're going to talk some draft. Also, just to let you guys know the voicemail video, call the voicemail line 860-516-4119. Talk about that time you saw somebody quit their job in the middle of their shift. Go ahead, check that out. But NFL draft, Dominique, the draft as a like consumption product, it is, I have to admit, it is a lot more interesting when there are lots of intriguing quarterbacks as opposed yeah. to this set of quarterbacks that everybody try to talk themselves into, <laughs> which is never a good side. Yeah, they've, they've changed everything, the rules, the game, the marketing, all to make it so quarterbacks are of paramount importance, and that is the case again this year. But to be fair, it's like there's no like Miles Garrett in the draft either. Right. So like when you look at it, it's not just that there aren't any quarterbacks. There's also, like, no, I mean, there are people that you think potentially could grow into someone that can change the complexion of your defense. And maybe even some of the receivers, you're like, they could con could change the complexion of our offense, maybe. But it's nobody that you just know. Like, when Miles Garrett was in the draft, that's a, that's a n name that keeps coming to mind for me. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't, give, I don't give a damn what scheme you put them in. I don't care who coach them. Put that man on the field, and your team just got better. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is the two guys whose names were getting bounced around for the number one overall pick. You guys saw last night, whichever one was the number one overall pick, is Trayvon Walker and uh, Aiden Hutchinson. And what's interesting about that to me is Trayvon Walker coming into this draft reminds me a bit of when they were coming into that Mario Williams draft. And I was living in North Carolina at the time. And so all the complaints about Mario not actually producing and people saying he wasn't trying that hard and all of that stuff. Like I'd heard all of that before all the people paid attention to the draft had heard it. And I was very surprised that they took him number one when it came down to it. Uh, it, by the way, turned out to absolutely be the right pick in hindsight. Mm -hmm. But I'll never forget years later, I was talking to my man, Steve White. And Steve had worked as, a, I think, a grad assistant at uh, South Florida when they played North Carolina State in a bowl game. And he said that he remembered watching the film of Mario Williams. You know, Steve was a defensive lineman for, I want to say, uh -huh. seven years in the NFL. Steve said he watched that film of Mario Williams. He said he just went over to the offensive coaches and said, so what y'all going to do with that big joker? <laughs> laughed and walked out the room right he was just like don't don't like for those of you who don't know what you're doing when you're watching this stuff which would definitely yeah. include me he's like nah don't get it twisted and i wonder if that's the case with the walker dude because the production was not necessarily there but what worries me about somebody like hutchinson is when you start talking about how polished a college player is yeah. i'm like i shouldn't even know that yet like you should just be dominating yeah. cats and it comes right. up later right and I mean, the, the example of that where it works, and it also happened to be white player, is Bosa. I was about and to bring that yeah, up. Yeah, that's the same one where it was like, this is good as he going to be. And it just so <laughs> happened that that's all, all, I mean, either one of them. And it just so happened that that's also good enough to be uh, 
impactful at a, I mean, I didn't want to say transformation. I don't want to be exaggerating, but like Pro Bowl level impactful on an NFL team. And they all have like um, fathers who played the same position and were doing the same thing. So you would expect them to know what the hell they're doing. But I'm with you. I like a little, I like a little bit of like, you just realer than everybody else. <laughs> Let me teach you some moves, you know? Yes. That, that feels like the sky's the limit. But Hutch, Hutch going to be Hutch. Yeah. Let me tell you, the thing about Bosa, it's funny you mentioned that, because Bosa I was going to bring up is that with Joey Bosa, that was the question. It really just had a lot to do with, yeah, he's really good, but we talking a lot about fundamentals and everything. And in the way that David Carr cost Derek Carr a lot of money, uh-huh. Joey Bosa made yeah. Nick Bosa yeah. a lot of money. Because I feel like if Nick Bosa had come before Joey, we would have been saying the same thing. And I think Joey went like five or something like that. Like, uh-huh. it, was, it wasn't a precipitous drop, but it was a little bit of a fall. Man, after that, we went go going to make that mistake with that next Bosa. We were like, no, come on up here. <laughs> and, I mean, so, yeah, I, I was kind of leaning towards Hutchinson for that reason, partially the Bosa thing, but <clears> – <throat> And I, I didn't see a ton out of Trayvon Walker that thought I should be up, he'd be up there or, or the Thibodeau guy that I thought he should be up there. And I had to just be honest with myself and accept my biases. Like, <laughs> I think Stingley should be the guy, man. And I know that people don't even think he's the best corner. I don't care what them people think. Like, that's <laughs> – when I watch these people play and then I take into account the modern game and how, like, I think analytically they've – come to the conclusion that cornerback is the most important position on defense. Like, if you have a good corner, it will help, or a great corner, like Stingley can be, it'll help your defense more than having any other single one player. And then this man is a true freshman, 18 years old, walk into the SEC and is the best cornerback in all of college football. I know his play declined a little bit in the subsequent years, <clears throat> but again, maybe that's about the talent part that I like to see. When I see guys that can move their hands and their feet simultaneously, which I know sounds stupid, but like in press coverage, to be able to move laterally and it not take away from your hands, like it's a really hard thing to do. And he's able to do that. He can play man coverage against the very best receivers in the NFL. He can do that in a way that is like not scary. It changes everything on your team. That's my guy. Yo, so here's my thing about Derek Stangley, who's corner at LSU, and I am with you. And this is a little bit of a hot take. Okay, it's not even so much a hot take as much as I'm going to probably sound like a jerk, but I feel like by the time I get through explaining it, people will understand it. I feel like people with very special talent are better equipped to evaluate something like Derek Stingley's career. I'm not talking about his game and all that stuff because I'm not qualified to do that. You can do that. But this is what I'm talking about. You pointed it out, and this is the real. As an 18-year-old freshman on that national championship LSU team, Derek Stingley was probably the best defensive player in the country. He walked into the door at 18 and you tell me if I'm exaggerating, Dominique. Not at he all. He could have played in the NFL at 19 in terms of skill. Like physically and being able to handle all of it, I don't know. But in terms of skill, he walked in. I've, there are so few players who walk into college football NFL ready that you can name every single one of them that you're thinking of. Like for me, it's Herschel Walker, Adrian Peterson, Bo Jackson. Like those are the levels of players that walked in the door ready to play in the NFL right now. Derek Stingley is the fourth. I really can't think of anybody else that was ready. Next two years, I think he played, what, 10 games? There were some injuries. He didn't play as well. Okay, so this is my question. Did you think he stopped knowing how to play? Do you think they? Do you think he regressed? Do you think he got worse? Because I don't think that would be the case with the 18-year-old. I think he played worse, but he didn't get worse. And so I'm looking at him, and I'm like, okay, I walked in the door at 18 years old, and I'm better than everybody else here. There's nobody on the other side of me that can do anything with me. Can you imagine how bored you would be? Because this isn't like you're Randy Moss in that situation. Because when you're Randy Moss in that situation, what do they do? They throw you the ball. 
When you Derek Stingley in that situation, you just run sprints. That's the only thing that you do. There's no action for you. I can't imagine how bored he got. So to me, when I see a guy, like there was no reason to watch any film on him after his freshman year. That's the guy you talking about right there. Yeah. This other guy is far more likely to be a product of condition and for playing in the Ed Ogeron crazy house for the uh -huh. next two years. I hadn't even thought of that as a theory because I didn't even need a damn theory. I like your theory. It's smart, and I'm going to start using it. I'll give you credit, not that you care, but that makes sense. As a corner, you can get bored. And and then you get that one or two passes thrown on you, then, oh, you had a bad game. Then next thing you know, you only had 30 passes thrown in your direction all season, and 10 of them was caught, and you wasn't really up for it. Like, that that all makes sense. But I ain't need it because of what you said before. <laughs> That man was 18 years old. <laughs> like, that dude took off his prom corsage or whatever you do. <laughs> walked into LS Damn You. The best producer of defensive backs in the country. And was immediately the best man <laughs> on their defense. <laughs> and was in practice against the receivers who are currently the best in the NFL. Jamar Chase. <laughs> Strapping them. <laughs> strapping them <laughs> strapping them as an 18 year old freshman and like i i didn't know the reason for the decline like he had some foot issues or whatever i didn't and maybe it was the ed orger on crazy house like i heard that too i didn't know but i didn't care if no. it wasn't like some like some psychological break and even if it was we got doctors and medication for that <laughs> the talent that that man showed at a eight. Mm, I, That's all I'm saying. That's all and I'm it's saying. Not like, it's not like when I was 18 and went to Maryland. No disrespect to Maryland. We was not national championship competitors. Florida taught us that in the Orange Bowl. <laughs> and I walked in and I didn't start on day one. And not that compare me to Derek Stingley, but I, I have experienced what the jump is. From you know being, what it is. <laughs> I know what it means to be an 18-year-old boy and then line up against a 21-year-old man who's been lifting weights and going up against NFL caliber cornerbacks. Like, I know. And it didn't take forever for me to get, like, to get up to speed. But, like, to get to average, even to get to average, to get to the point where I wasn't embarrassing myself in practice, it took a month. Then it took a couple more months to be like, all right, now you mixed in. You don't look like a walk-on. You don't look like a walk-on. And then it takes like a year before you're like, all right, you nice. And then it takes more time to get to you the best in the country. I never got to that, but he walked in like that. <laughs> so let's stop playing and get and sign him up. Don't overthink it. Sign him up. And Dude. it's like he got, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I have a bias against small schools too sometimes. And maybe that means that I over like index these big school players. But it's there's something to be said for showing up for two or three games a year, there's something else to be said for showing up for every damn practice. <laughs> every practice he against number one <laughs> overall draft picks. All right, I'm, I'm done. They say if you want to get to know a person, travel with them. And the same is true for cars. That's why CarMax has reimagined the test drive with their new Love Your Car guarantee. Starting with a 24-hour test drive before you buy. And after you buy, CarMax has you covered with a 30-day money-back guarantee up to 1,500 miles. So hit the road and really get to know your car with the new Love Your Car guarantee. Learn more at CarMax.com. CarMax. Car buying reimagined. With Stingley, like we, we send a text during the week and we try to figure out what we're going to talk about. And you mentioned that you wanted to talk about Stingley. And I had... I had been waiting for him to rise up the draft board, right? Because it's almost predictable in a way because we do so much overthinking and then people want to be the cool ones to throw a name out of this, somebody that's bouncing around. And then by the end, people do by and large get their minds right, right? Like, like when you think about it, for the most part, there's like exceptions like Lamar Jackson, but normally when a guy starts falling in the draft, that guy doesn't often turn out to be good. Right. Yeah. Like it just turns out we've been talking. We've been talking this one thing and the real thing was actually this other thing. And now the experts have played this out. But with Stingley, I was just like, OK, so when are people going to get their minds right? Just the simple fact that you're not going to be able to look at what he was at 18 and dismiss it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you're not going to be able to look at that 
and then just be like, okay, well, no, that wasn't the guy. No, 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 this second guy. No, you go tell yourself that first guy is somewhere. And I just imagine that he was bored. Like I would say about Moss, we always evaluated Moss the wrong way in terms of his behavior, which was often indefensible. But we viewed him as malcontent rather than prodigy. Uh -huh. Like if you go watch Amadeus, Randy right. Moss makes a lot more sense when you think of it in that context. But people... People can see exceptional talent, but they don't recognize really what some of the other stuff is that comes with it. And so with Stingley, that was my first thought. It's like, if he's that good as a freshman, why am I here? What is there for me to do? Yeah. I mean, unless there was some catastrophic injury, like I mentioned, unless there is something to explain. And I guess that's the difference between me and you is like, I was thinking about it from one side and you looked at it from both sides. You were looking for a way to explain why he declined and I was looking for like a, a way to explain why people have forgotten about him and like mm. the your explanation makes sense but like I said before I didn't need it and like <laughs> they try to put sauce over top of him who like sauce Gardner um at Cincinnati like he's very good but I think I was like sending a bit of a subliminal shot when I was talking about the get up for every game get up for every practice like, it's, it's, it's a little different playing Cincinnati schedule than it is yeah. playing the LSU schedule. It's a little different in practice. And Sauce is, uh, was late to the position, or excuse me, late to, like, develop like a player. So yeah. he certainly was good enough to play in the SEC. But he ended up with the, with the Bearcats. And the last thing, reason why I go Stingley over Gardner, and Gardner, I think, should be highly drafted, too, over some of these edge defenders that people really love. But... It's because Stingley played, like, LSU, they played man coverage, like, 70% of the snaps. And the modern NFL, even the zone-heavy teams, you have to play man coverage sometimes. You have to yeah. play it sometimes. And it's the hardest thing to do. You find somebody that can do that, and you better sign them up. Yeah, I just think people need to, people need to operate on what I think is a measure of common sense. The dude yeah. didn't get worse, right? Yeah. Even if his play got worse, the dude worse, himself... Right did not get worse like that's just with not the ball possible. in the air with the ball in the air that's another thing like all this stuff together the ability to move his feet in hand simultaneously and press coverage is something really difficult to do i like that the ability to run with receivers who are incredibly fast like straight line rare he's got that ability to change directions with small shifty guys he's got that and then the icing on the cake that you rarely find in the corner because we love touchdowns so much he tracks the ball and attacks the ball and catches the ball like a receiver. And normally, if you have that level of freaky athleticism, when you're a kid, they put you on the offensive side of the ball. And and you stay there. You find a way to stay there. And given his um, bloodlines are from receivers, like, I'm surprised that that's not where he ended up. But well, boy, am well, I happy that well, he didn't. Well, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, yeah I, guess I, don't, that, I, I guess that I makes sense. Never mind. I don't, I don't want to reach, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, but nah, I feel like sense. that bloodline is aware of yeah, some of the uh, hazards of yeah, playing wide receiver, receiver in a way that That's would make fair. you want to be the person on the other side. It probably was like, if you want to play, if you're going to play, you yeah. gonna play defense. Yeah, there, there yeah. is, there's no Jack Tatum of receivers, yeah, right? Like, oh, you got to watch out when he yes. runs the post. <laughs> he might take Man. you out. <laughs> Man, that's tough. But yeah, I, all that together is he's a uh, like. He has Hall of Fame ability and yeah. at the most important position on that side of the ball. So draft him. Don't mess around. You know, my favorite story, though, on the made him into a receiver guy. Do you? I don't. Like, I guess you guys are of, of similar age. Ted Ginn. Oh, yeah. When Ted Ginn was coming out of high school, he was projected as being a Pro Bowl corner. Like, he, uh -huh. went, to, he went to Ohio State to play corner, but then they did the opposite of the Chris Gamble thing where they needed a receiver. And so they put Ted Ginn over there, a receiver. And Ted Ginn was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean they going to be hitting me? Like Ted Ginn would have been the, the, it would have been Deion Sanders, not necessarily as good as like playing right. corner, but definitely with a similar, similar tackling philosophy. <laughs> if Ted Ginn's NFL career was any indication, but I say this for Ted Ginn, Ted Ginn played like 13, 14 years and commanded a double team the whole time. Cause uh -huh. he was playing the long game, not the short game. Very, very, very smart. Wise beyond his years. And <laughs> I think to your point about simplifying this stuff is, we get so caught up in like thinking, oh, this guy's that, this guy's this, this guy needs to play here. 
Debo Samuel taught it to us. Ted Ginn apparently has taught it to us. And now Derek Stingley is teaching it to us. Like, some people are just real. And you put them out there, put them somewhere, they're going to find a way to make an impact. And that's how I feel about Stingley. So he could play Yo, did, wherever you want. Did you see the story that David Newton did about everything that went into the Cam Newton selection with the Panthers? Uh-uh. It's really interesting and a classic story of overthinking. Now, I had, I wasn't like super plugged in, but I was fairly plugged in on what the Panthers were doing when they, you know, with the 2011 draft, which for what it's worth turned out to be an all-time great draft. But I remember the first thing that I had heard was that the two guys the Panthers were thinking about taking at first were Patrick Peterson and A.J. Green. Like, they were the two guys that they were really excited about. That A.J. Green was the type of guy you build a team around, and I mean... I mean, both Patrick Peterson and A.J. Green. Patrick Peterson will make the Hall of Fame. I think A.J. Uh -huh. Green has a chance, not necessarily guaranteed, but they were that level of good. But, man, you looked at that draft, even with Von Miller, even with Tyron Smith, even with everybody that was in that draft, it was like, okay, but that guy, that's, that's, the, that's the one that you take. We line all these dudes yeah. up against the wall, and I tell you, oh, by the way, that guy's the quarterback and he's fast. You take that guy. But everywhere, they talk about the heated arguments they were having or about the fact that they're in there and nobody was confident enough to say that they thought that you should take Cam Newton number one, that there was only one guy in the room who was willing to say, and it was like a, it was a scouting director or something like that, but it just one guy to be like, yeah, I think we should maybe take Cam Newton. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, how in the world did you guys waste this much thought effort everything else in there our quarterback <laughs> is jimmy clausen and superman is in this draft they're like well what about the system and everything i was like you guys they talk about all the, the private investigators they had you know everything else and talk to all these people so they could do what all of us could figure out from right here take that guy it is amazing all the way to me the number one overall pick that should be easy if we got to do all be. this digging to figure it out we got the wrong guy anybody on the street should be able to make the number one pick <laughs> and I feel like the whole first round, like all, all this staff we pay is to make sure we get steals on day two, three, and so on. Like if we get you with our first overall pick, it should be it should be either easy because you stand out or easy because there's a few of y'all and it don't matter <laughs> which one. <laughs> and it shouldn't be that hard to find. So I, I'm, I'm with you. Cam Newton shows up looking how he looks, playing, and it's not even just looking how he looks. That man put that squad on his back. And if the if your scheme don't work, like this is obvious. Your scheme don't work, your scheme is wrong. Yes. <laughs> like change your scheme. And and when I was in high school, I played running back and safety for my sophomore and junior year. My senior year, we were uh, we lost our quarterback and we um lost a game we shouldn't have lost early in the season. The next week I was at quarterback and we was doing zone read. The coach was not a very good coach, but he looked around and was like, oh. We had, a, we had a receiver who was pretty good leave and a quarterback who had a strong arm leave. And so they couldn't, like, load the box against me. Then the next year they could. And then he was like, all right, well, you don't want to do that? Zone read them to sleep. We ain't losing another <laughs> game the rest of the year. I was scoring four and five touchdowns a week. It was, it was outstanding. And it's the same thing you should have – because, I, I mean, I can throw, but I can't throw. Right. But it's the same thing you should do when somebody who is clearly better than everybody else is there. You give him the ball and get out the way. Dog, uh, Cam Newton played on a team with one other NFL player. In the SEC. In the SEC. With one of, and by the way, not like he was there for years. He just showed uh -huh. up in January. <laughs> they had one other Forgot NFL player, uh -huh. and they went undefeated and won the national championship. What else is there for us to discuss? Like, if he was like 5'11", 175 or something like okay, that. we can chat. Okay, right? Like, no, 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 no. Like, Tommy Frazier, I used to say, was the best college quarterback I'd ever seen, right? Mm -hmm. Tommy Frazier was surrounded by greatness. Cam Newton was surrounded by dudes, and they really were sitting up in there fighting about whether or not to t when they didn't have a quarterback. 6'5", 245, 250. Superman. Yes. And he put them on his back and took them all the way. You ever think about, I imagine that you, as much as you know about college football, 
probably thought about what that Florida team would have been like had Cam Newton taken over for Tim Tebow. Well, how about this? Let's not say had taken over for Tim Tebow, okay? Look, Tim Tebow has maybe the greatest resume of any college football player other than Herschel Walker. Like, Herschel Walker is gold standard. Walk in the door, three SEC championships, three Sugar Bowls, a national championship, probably should have won the Heisman at least two out of three years, but got the one, right? Okay. But you're not going to be able to convince me that in 2011, Cam Newton was that much better than Tim Tebow. That much more physically talented. But he wasn't better than him in 2008. Now, at eight, that's when Newton was hurt, obviously. But if Newton was still there in 2009, you telling me he wasn't better? You're not going to tell me. You're going to have a hard time convincing me that Cam Newton walked in the door in 2007 and he wasn't better than Tim Tebow was. Like, I know there's improvement. I know there's all those things. But I would t- like talk to guys who were around that program. There were a lot of people walking around like, hey, uh, <laughs> have you seen this other guy? And I get why, you, especially after Tebow wins the Heisman, I get why you yeah. don't make the move. You know, yeah, you can't. Yeah. But the greatness of Tim Tebow, that's how good the rest of them Florida dudes were. Is that it didn't matter if you had Tim Tebow or Cam Newton. That's how good they were. That is crazy. And like the I'm looking at that recruiting class that Cam came in on and the Pounceys were four stars. Yes. <laughs> uh, Aaron, Hernandez Aaron Hernandez was a four star. Was a four star. Like, this class was bananas. And the, and the class the year before is the one that was considered to be the great one. They brought yeah. in two pounces, Cam Newton, and what was that? And Aaron Hernandez, rest mm-hmm. in peace. They brought them in, and that wasn't the bomb class. It's the year before with Percy Harvin, <laughs> Tim Tebow. Oh, I'm for, Joe Hayden was in that class? Yeah, what was Urban doing? What was he paying them? I mean, <laughs> that's what drove him crazy urban had yeah. been recruiting at bowling green and had been recruiting at utah and then he got they were like oh no 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 you gotta play a, a different game yeah, here yeah. <laughs> well, yeah i'm looking at that year before recruiting recruiting class it wasn't as highly touted i don't think but well percy players, Arvin was man. the number one player in america yeah. that year and then tim tebow was up there and brandon spikes yes oh man that's yeah, it was loaded. Yeah, they, they they got some ballers, man. And and they, uh-huh. and had ballers already. Like the yeah. guy, they didn't fire Ron Zook because he wasn't getting players. They <laughs> fired him because them players wasn't winning enough. Yeah, I'm looking at um 247 sports, and they have that class as the number two class in the country. That 06 class is the number yeah. two class in the country. Whew. And I believe number one may have been Texas. I don't know. The next year, their Aaron Hernandez year was um was the number one class in the country. Let me Got see. it. I mean, according to this site. Yeah, I mean. Crazy. Yeah, man. Dudes, it matters. It's like like having dudes. Like, and one thing I love, I enjoy talking to defensive players about evaluation a bit more than offensive players. Because offensive, like, quarterbacks and stuff, and they start getting into the weeds and all this stuff, defensive players are like, yo, that's a dude. Like, when you would hear, from, uh, like, after Clowney's Pro Day in 14, the uh-huh. defensive players are coming out of there like, dog, what are you talking about? There's no discussion to be had here. You see, you see, um, what's the name? Jordan Davis? Yes. I was looking for comps for him. And so I started thinking, I started thinking of like the big guys, like Haloti Nada, like big athletic guys, like Haloti Nada, um, who else was falling in that, that uh, category? Like, like Vita Butner? Vea. Yeah, I mean, well, Buckner's like a more of a long. Right, because he's only like he's like two ninety five, and this dude's like three sixty. Yeah, he's three. Yeah, and so I was thinking of these guys, looking up comps for him, and come to find out, like he tests better than all of them. But that's not the thing that blew my mind is they not even legit comps because he's three inches taller (laughs) than these dudes. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like Vita Vea, Don Terry Poe, I found my list, and Haloti Nada were the names that came to mind. They all 6'4. He's 6'6. Six, six. And he ran a four damn seven. And he's like at in 340, 90% right? at 340 pounds. 
And like the knock on him is like he can't play every down. Of course the hell he can't. <laughs> like can you imagine what like what energy you must have to expend to make a Mack truck go 120 miles an hour? Yeah, we're gonna have to fuel up a little more often. But that man, I don't know if it's gonna translate, but I know it's gonna translate. Oh, no, <laughs> it's gonna do something. Can you imagine that what it was like to play against Georgia this year? Cause they got yeah. like five these guys in the first round and then the kobe dean the linebacker they have this the most special thing about him is like his his brain moves as fast as his feet and everything as fast as anything on the field like i want to see him against a shanahan play action offense because i i've never seen him be wrong like he, <laughs> and i've never seen him be fooled he don't bite on play action he must he reads the guards uh, as well as anybody, he always makes the right move. Like he see, they running double and triple screens on him, and there's no way to know. Like I'm watching the film on slow mo three times over. Like what was his key? And he picked the right screen every time. And like how the hell did you know? Like, I I can't find it, and I don't, don't know. He's an engineer major. Like oh, like, okay. but think about this. I mean, I'm all these things, but I can't think fast in athletic competition. Football, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, like, I, like, I can't do that. I'm always amazed by people's ability to continue all this processing in the midst of the chaos that is playing sports. But Georgia had like five, six dudes that is just like, and then I think their secondary was all children this year. So like everybody else gets to deal with them and then they just go rattle in, mo front seven hogs, is mo that, coming. That brings us back to Stingley. Imagine <laughs> if your secondary is all children and they all are the best of the league. How they go pass on him? He's stupid. <laughs> hey man, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about this uh, NBA here. You see Chris Paul kick somebody in the nuts again? Yep, he's uh, he's worked on it. He's found new ways to do it. Why though? <sighs> like, I don't get it. like he he the great he the Grayson Allen of his generation. Like you imagine how much we'd hate Chris Paul if he went to Duke. <sighs> Yeah, Why didn't he yeah. go to Duke? I don't know. It's a good question. He went to Wake, so like it wasn't far. I don't, I don't know why he en- ended up down there and not Duke. But yeah, that's. I mean, maybe they wasn't. Never mind. <laughs> that wasn't. I, I have a hard time. I like Chris Paul, like as a person and as a player. But that stuff is like we talk about. Is there any other greatest of all time? Like, we talk about him in that conversation of greatest of all time his yes. position. Is there any other greatest of all time in anything that we like, hey, he was great, but he sure did do a lot of nut punching? Well, nut punching, not specifically. I think there's a bunch of people that kind of feel that way about, like, Isaiah Thomas, for example. Uh, like, like, there aren't that many people who play as dirty as Chris Paul where their dirty play is not the top line of the resume. You know what I'm saying? Like, you remember, I don't know if you remember Kevin Gogan used to play for yeah. the, like, that was the top line. On him, the dude who uppercut Neil Smith in the nuts on a dead ball on a sucker punch once it got thrown out of a game, right? But that was top line Kevin Gogan behavior was doing that kind of stuff, right? Chris Paul, and we keep calling him out on it. We've been doing it since he was a sophomore in college. That's crazy. And he still insists upon behaving like this. And <sighs> why, bruh? Why? He just yeah. don't care. That's the wildest thing. He just don't care. It's so weird, though, because, like, it was suggesting to me that he can't control it. But he seems to be the most in-control guy on the floor. He doesn't have, like, a litany of off-court, out-of-control issues. Like, it's just a part of his game. Like, it's not a mistake. It's not, like, a impulse. Like, this dude, that's, that's one of his moves. He gonna break it out every now and then, and it's calculated, and it's infuriating. But, but I tell you this, I can't imagine how infuriating it must be or must have been Playing with Al, play, being guarded by Alvarado all night. Cause look, Alvarado, <laughs> the old, like Alvarado's yeah. in the league to do this. I could be yeah. totally wrong because I don't watch them play that much. But I have not seen any other NBA level skill other than being annoying. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's he, he's playing with confidence now. I see him shooting and stuff in the games that I'm watching. But you're right, it's it, he's on the floor because he's annoying. Yes, <laughs> like he's a pesky guy. That's the reason why he's out. Yes. If he gives you anything else, it's a bonus. Just, yeah, is there any more backhand to compliment? In like, he's pesky. <laughs> <laughs> he's pesky. Yeah, he is. I don't know, and I feel like 
the hair also makes me think pesky. I don't know why. It gives yes. me the combine of the play. I think it's just the, I don't know, you don't want to get it braided or nothing. Like get, a tight, no. get a tight slick back huh? he ain't got no. time for that he ain't got time for that this is all the brand you know what i'm saying like that's when people fair. become closers in baseball and that's when they grow like a funny mustache or something like that it's like <laughs> yo it's the brand like when when that dude right there shows up you know exactly what time it is there is a value in that like i always say and people know it is especially for college basketball the dude who shows up with the shoulder length dreads and the t-shirt underneath it don't matter how big he is, anything else. You know exactly what time it is when that dude comes to play. And his number one move is the pump fake with the shoulder under your chin, right? You know that, you know exactly. It don't matter if he clean shaven. It don't matter if he got uh. a beard. But that guy always play. They all play the same. <laughs> they all do. That's, that's, they, they play like football players. <laughs> yes. That's, that's the guy, yeah. And... and um, we were the we were talking football draft earlier, and you brought up basketball. It just made me remember Julius Peppers. Like I feel when we were talking about guys. I was a freshman when he was. I guess he was a junior. His year before he left, and our first game was against North Carolina, and I saw him on the field, and I was 18, and I was like, nah, just nah. I don't know what to say. Just nah, that ain't. And then I saw what he we won, but it's unblockable. Yeah, and that was actually a pretty good team North Carolina had yeah. that year. Uh, we were good, too. I don't, I don't yeah, yeah, I won the ACC. That sideways, comp- that sideways insult. No, no, it wasn't a sideways insult. It was just letting people know you would assume that North Carolina was not good. And oh, yeah, yeah. I just needed to really like, good. yeah, y'all won the ACC, but they, I think they went to the Peach Bowl that year. And I know mm-hmm. that because they were very happy about that when I moved there in 2003. And like, we was just in the Peach Bowl. The, the <laughs> thing about Pep playing basketball is, and like, you go to college and you watch intramurals. There's always the football team is always in intramurals, and it's big old unskilled athletic dudes just running the break. And they'd always lose to the law school or the business school because they would have former college yes. athletes who actually were good at playing. But the football team is just running up and down the floor. Julius Peppers brought that life to ACC basketball. The Incredible. big, except he was skilled, like yeah. the big giant, faster than everybody guy, just running the floor. He looked like in his basketball jersey. He looked like, like when they have TV shows and they like cast a basketball player, and they don't know what basketball players look like. They just think they got muscles because yes. they're professional athletes. That's what he looked like in his jersey. Like it did. It looked like a football player in a basketball jersey. And you're right. He was skilled, but that's not what stood out about him. No, what stood no, out about him was, he was yeah. It was like Cam Newton. It's like <laughs> when you turn on the tape, even if he ain't the best on the floor, he stands out. Yo, because he's doing I, stuff nobody else can do. And the thing is, I bet Pep's jeans are probably like a thirty-one or a thirty-two. Yep. <laughs> yep. Like I got some story once about Carl Malone. It said Carl Malone wore something like a thirty in the waist. I wear a thirty in the waist, yeah, something around yeah. there. That, yeah. Carl Malone joined is seventy-five pounds. There's something going on with some of these people genetically that just ain't right. And they the only I, dudes I mean, that they the only dudes that go to Marshalls looking for the irregular. You know what I'm saying? Like I need something <laughs> where the legs is bigger than the waist. Y'all got any of those? <laughs> there's nothing. I have to imagine there's nothing worse to, than being six. I mean, I'm sure there are other things worse, but one of the worst things is being an enormous person who stinks at sports. Yeah. Like just going through the world, being big and broke. Yeah. But I say you better be make the hard. NBA. Otherwise, what you going to wear? <laughs> you got, I don't know. You got to find, you got to get your stuff custom made. That's what I say. You pep and you ain't got NBA money. You just going to be walking around here looking like the Incredible Hulk all the time. Like that's, that's all you could do is buy stuff and cut it off. Like I remember the day my daddy showed me, he taught me, he was like, yeah, man. So, you know, this happened, you know, we long arm types, you know, what's happened with yeah. your sleeves. But when that happened, you just got to. Yeah, just roll it up, baby. Roll it up. <laughs> so what if you were Julius Pepper's kid and you came out like 5'11", 170? You just mad at mom? You mad at mom? <laughs> you do this to me for? I mean, or it could be a daughter. That's fine. But otherwise, just mad or, at mom. Or I ain't gonna lie. If I'm Julius Peppers and my kid come out 5'10", 170, hey, little man, how'd you like to take a trip to a laboratory? <laughs> You're not afraid of needles, are you? Because I got to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, you Julius Peppers and your kid come out small, That'd be like if you was, I don't know, Tom Cruise and your kid come out looking like the cover to Ready to Die. Like, hey, 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 <laughs> yeah, hey wait so, a minute, yeah. wait a minute, wait a minute. 
That is that is as stark a difference. Like yeah, I don't <laughs> believe that is possible. Like I would think next, like I'd be more surprised if Julius Peppers. Or I'd be less surprised if Julius Pepper had like a white kid that was enormous <laughs> than if he had a small black kid. I'd be like, oh, that ain't Julius' son. No, no, no. But hey, man, that is Dominique Foxworth. Check him out on Get Up. Check him out on Debatable. Check him out on the Anscape. He be all over the place. My man is greatly appreciated. Thank you, brother. All right, man. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here on The Right Time. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Don't forget, uh, voicemail, 860-516-4119. Let us know your stories about uh, people quitting on the job in the middle of the shift. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater, and we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy.